God is how we imaginatively and collectively represent the existence and action of consciousness across time, as the most real aspects of existence manifest themselves across the longest of time frames, but are not necessarily apprehensible as objects in the here and now. There's a, there's a representation of, there's a historical representation of his, of, of his existence as well. Now you can debate whether or not that's genuine, but partly because it's too terrifying a reality to fully believe. I don't even know what would happen to you if you fully believed it. People often ask me if I believe in God. I don't like that question, so <laughs> I, I, I won't ask that question. But the role, you just talked about values. Mm -hmm. So here's a question. I want to hear how you think about this. this. This is a question that strikes me as philosophy 101, although I have to admit there are other people who just see, that, see no traction in this one at all. My late friend Christopher Hitchens just batted this one away. And here's the question. If there is no standard, we don't have to rise to the calling it God, but if there's no objective standard of reason outside and above ourselves, if everything is just matter, how can we think? How can we do science? Mm -hmm. C.S. Mm -hmm. Lewis, mm -hmm. this is C.S. Lewis. And Hitchens just thought this made no sense at all, but it, I feel it. C.S. Lewis, if I swallow the scientific cosmology as a whole, meaning only all that exists is what we can perceive through our senses, then not only can I not fit in religion, I cannot even fit in science. If mm -hmm. minds mm -hmm. are wholly dependent on brains and brains on biochemistry, and biochemistry in the long run on the meaningless flux of the atoms, I cannot understand how the thought of minds should have any more significance than the sound of the wind in the trees. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You feel that one as well. Yeah, well, that's a complicated problem. That, um, first of all, I do believe that, I don't think science is possible outside of an encompassing Judeo-Christian ethic. So, for example, I don't think you can be a scientist without believing as an axiom of faith that truth will set you free or that will set us free. So we don't know the conditions under which science is possible, you know, um, and we tend to overestimate its epistemological potency. It's only been around, I mean you can stretch it back to the Greeks if you're inclined, but in a formal sense it's only been around for about five centuries and it's only thrived for a very short period of time and it's perfectly reasonable to assume that there were particular preconditions that made its rise and ascendancy possible. It is um, a historical phenomenon. Yes, it happened it, at a specific moment in time. Right, and for and at least so in principle say, for conditions? particular reasons. Yeah, Got, and I think okay. one of the conditions, well, there's a bunch of them. One is, for example, there, there's an intense insistence in the Christian tradition that the mind of God in some sense is knowable. Yes. So we could say, well, the structure of the cosmos, and you have to believe that that's the case before you're going to embark on a scientific endeavor. You have to believe that there's some relationship between logos logic, let's say, but logos is a much broader concept than logic, that's for sure. You have to believe that there's some relationship between that and the structure of the cosmos. You have to believe that the pursuit of truth is in itself an ethical good, because why would you otherwise bother? You have to believe that there is such a thing as an ethical good, and those, aren't scientific, those are not scientific questions, which is why I think the arguments of people like Hitchens are weak. It's like, yeah, Hitchens, Dawkins, people like that, they have a metaphysic which they don't know, and they assume that metaphysic is self-evident, it's like, well, sorry guys, it's abs actually not self-evident, and they assume that it can be derived from the observations of empirical reality, and the answer to that is, no, there's going to be axioms of your perceptual system that aren't derivable from the contents of your perceptual system. And you might think, well, that's not very scientific, and I would say, well, take it up with Roger Penrose and see what he thinks. Because I just talked to him for like three hours about, partly about this topic, about mm -hmm. say the role of consciousness and, and the structure of consciousness, and it's by no means obvious that the materialist reductionists have the correct theory about the nature of consciousness. And not surprisingly, it's like, we, we don't understand the relationship between consciousness and being at all. And so they're, you know, the, these are hard, hard questions. Well, they're the hardest, the, the hard question for consciousness researchers is, uh, why is there consciousness? rather than, why aren't we just unconscious mechanisms acting deterministically? They call that the hard question. 
I don't think that is the hard question. I think the hard question is what's the relationship between consciousness and being itself? And because I don't I can't understand what it means for something to be in the absence of some awareness of that being. So when we say being, there's an awareness component implicit in the in the idea of being itself. So consciousness is integrally tied up with being in some mysterious manner. And so and I also don't believe that the the most sophisticated scientists are by necessity reductionist materialists like get as far as you can with that no problem it's it's Occam's razor clear if you can reduce and account deterministically no problem but don't be thinking that accounts for everything because I don't think there's any evidence that it does God is how we imaginatively and collectively represent the existence and action of consciousness across time as the most real aspects of existence manifest themselves across the longest of time frames but are not necessarily apprehensible as objects in the here and now. So what that means in some sense is that you have conceptions of reality built into your biological and metaphysical structure that are a consequence of processes of evolution that, that occurred over unbelievably vast expanses of time and that structure your perception of reality in ways that it wouldn't be structured if you only lived for the amount of time that you're going to live. And that's also part of the problem of deriving values from facts, because you're evanescent and, and you can't derive the right values from the facts that port portray themselves to you in your lifespan, which is why you have a biological structure that's like 3.5 billion years old. So God is that which eternally dies and is reborn in the pursuit of higher being and truth. That's a fundamental element of hero mythology. God is the highest value in the hierarchy of values. That's another way of looking at it. God is what calls and what responds in the eternal call to adventure. God is the voice of conscience. God is the source of judgment and mercy and guilt. God is the future to which we make sacrifices and something akin to the transcendental repository of reputation. Here's a cool one if you're an evolutionary biologist. God, <laughs> God, God is that which selects among men in the eternal hierarchy of men. So, you know, men arrange themselves into hierarchies and then men rise in the hierarchy. And there's principles that are important that determine the probability of their rise. And those principles aren't tyrannical power. They're something like the ability to articulate truth and the ability to be competent and the ability to make appropriate moral judgments. And if you can do that in a given situation, then all the other men will vote you up the hierarchy, so to speak, and that will radically increase your reproductive fitness. And the operation of that process across long expanses of time looks to me like it's codified in something like the notion of God the Father. It's also the same thing that makes women, men attractive to women. Because women peel off the top of the male hierarchy. And the question is, what should be at the top of the hierarchy? And the answer right now is tyranny as part of the patriarchy. But the real answer is something more like the ability to use truthful speech in the service of, let's say, well-being. And so that's, that's something that operates across tremendous expanses of time. And it plays a role in the selection for survival itself, which makes it a fundamental reality. This particular critic that I've been reading said, well, that, that doesn't differentiate Christ much from a whole sequence of dying and resurrecting mythological gods. And of course, people have made that claim in comparative religion. Joseph Campbell did that, and Jung to a lesser degree, I would say, but Campbell did that. But the difference, and C.S. Lewis pointed this out as well, the difference between those mythological gods and Christ was that there's a, there's a representation of there's a historical representation of his, of, of his existence as well. Now, you can debate whether or not that's genuine. You can debate about whether or not he actually lived and whether there's credible objective evidence for that, but it doesn't matter in some sense because this, well, it does, but there's a sense in which it doesn't matter because there's still a historical story. And so what you have in the figure of Christ is an actual person who actually lived plus a myth and in some sense, Christ is the union of those two things. The problem is, is I probably believe that, but I don't okay. know. I don't, I'm amazed at my own belief and I don't <laughs> understand it. Like, because I've seen. Sometimes the objective world and the narrative world touch you know, that's Jungian synchronicity. 
Yeah. And I've seen that many times in my own life. And so in some sense, I believe it's undeniable. You know, we have a narrative sense of the world. For me, that's been the world of morality. That's the world that tells us how to act. It's real, like we treat it like it's real. It's not the objective world, but the narrative and the objective world touch. And the ultimate example of that in principle is supposed to be Christ. But I don't know what to, and that seems to me oddly plausible. Yeah. Well, but I still don't know what to make of it. It's too, it, partly because it's too terrifying a reality to fully believe. I don't even know what would happen to you if you fully believed it. If you believed in the story of Christ, or if you believed that history and, and let's say the narrative make meet, let's both, say. Both, I yeah. think. I think you, because when you believe that, you buy both those stories. You believe that yeah. the narrative and the objective can actually touch.